What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop, and today I've got six Cartiers, many of which from my personal collection, including one very special watch that I never thought I'd ever be able to own, and probably a watch you haven't seen in person and might not ever. I don't understand why you're video is of course sponsored by our friends over at Z Biotics. Some more on that later. My love affair with Cartier is no secret at all. It has it has grown stronger and stronger by the year since I probably first found it eight years ago, seven years ago, around the time I was starting the company. At the time I was definitely more into into small classic but Rolex because they had a little bit you know, a little bit more uh, a substance, a little bit more size on the wrist, right? Everyone knows like a, a 36 or a 34 millimeter Rolex while small by modern standards was somewhat large by vintage standards because they were bulkier. It was that oyster case, you know? But then as I got more and more into watches, I, I found myself drawn to the Cartier brand. And then once you find yourself looking at the Cartier brand, then it's, it's a point of no return because the history is so, is so incredibly interesting, right? It's you know, wearing and owning... Cartier being synonymous with Cartier puts you like in this little club of of hyper cool I mean men and women um, uh, Andy Warhol Muhammad Ali Truman Capote Michael Douglas um, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy because I'll never say Onassis uh, you know a, a whole host of a, a remarkable list of people you know and it was a sign of elegance you know and when you really read about it you know when I really started to read about it I, I you know I, I started to say something. Um, in looking at all these different variations of these Cartiers, right? You have the tanks, and, and I'll talk about all these in a second, but I started to say, wow, over the years, Cartier, in their own language, reacts to the world around them. Whether they were looking at Chinese architecture, or they were looking at French bathtubs, or they were looking at Dali's persistence of memory, Cartier relax, reacts in their own language to the world around them, right? So I just became it's become such a part of my identity, you know, like uh, like the Yankees or Cuddy Sark Scotch. God, this is vintage TNH, huh? Um, so I began to build a collection of Cartier. I've got some of those watches here today for you, and I've got a couple of watches that uh, that are available in Theo and Harris shop as well. So I suppose we should start in the beginning um, with the Cartier tank. <music> This is the Cartier Tank Louis. This is not in my personal collection, although I have had many in my personal collection. This one is available in the Theo and Harris watch shop. Um, but this is, a, this is a hell of a watch, right? The Cartier Tank Louis has a bit of a confusing history, right? Because the Cartier Tank, which we associate with this watch, the Louis, was invented in 1917. But that actually wasn't the first Cartier Tank. The first Cartier Tank, the 1917 tank, was called the Normal. I actually do happen to have two normals, one in, in man size and one in lady size with diamonds, very, very cool. Um, I don't have those with me today. Those watches, for whatever reason, um, were not, that was not the model that, that became, you know, synonymous with the brand. That was not the model that, that went on to have the legs, right? It was its successor, the Louis, which was named after Louis Cartier. So the Louis is fundamentally very similar to the Tank Normal. It's just a little bit, I suppose, more refined. Right, the Normal was was modeled after the the Renault tanks of the First World War. It has this kind of industrial but elegant design, whereas Louis is more streamlined and I think it loses its industrial edge. And that's an interesting subject that we'll get back into later because Cartier, not Audemars Piguet or Patek Philippe, as many would think, invented this juxtaposition in watches between elegance and ruggedness, uh, elegance and industrial design. Mine was actually a Cartier idea. So this is the Louis. It is the quintessential Cartier. This has an elongated crown. It's just a beautiful watch. 18 karat yellow gold. This one is in manual. This is this is powered by a by a manually wound movement. A crisp white dial. Roman. This is a perfect watch. It has been it has been relevant since 1920, and it will never cease to be relevant. Um, I love it. There, you, know, you, you, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. Okay, so the next watch uh, I brought here, which is a watch in my personal collection, is a watch I'm very lucky to own, is a Cartier Tank Centre. Now, if you look at the Louis and look at the Centre, you can clearly tell that it's the same design language, right? Uh, you know, precious metal case. These two happen to be in the most common metal, which was 18 karat yellow gold. Um, crisp white dial. You've got you've got uh, black Roman numerals, blue uh, sword hands, um, extended blue crown, cabochon. It's the same watch, right? All intents and purposes. But 
uh, the centre was the centre was the normal and the Louis, but looked at in a I mean to say elongated would would just be would be would be non-descriptive, right? It is elongated, but it was it was more of a cuff. It was looked at as it, it was designed more. Uh, fluid, you know, it's a bizarre design if you think about it, you know, and of the era there were other curved watches, but nothing compared to the finesse uh, of the curve in, in the tanks and tray. Uh, not, in, it, not just to mention the, the, the case itself, but, but also the crystal. Uh, when you look at other brands that were producing curved watches in the first half of the 20th century, you had these incredible bulbous crystals. You know how fucking hard it was to, to manufacture these? Um, it's remarkable. So this is my watch. Um, uh, I love it. It has bold, bolded numerals, which wasn't normal. This watch was manufactured a little bit later, I believe, in the, I believe, in the sixties or seventies. I have to check. Um, but this watch, uh, the the the, the Centre, uh, was introduced in nineteen twenty one. So not so long after the original Louis. Let's take a quick second before we continue this beautiful conversation about my favorite brand in the world and talk about our friends over at Z Biotics. <laughs> Zbiotics is a probiotic drink that breaks down the byproducts of alcohol, which are quite often responsible for some of those rougher mornings after a night of drinking. So I know it might not come as a surprise to many of you, but I sometimes find myself knowing that Zbiotics will save me the next morning. So here's what I do. Before I start drinking, before even a first drop, I drink a bottle of Zbiotics. That's it. That's the only thing that you need for the entire night, whether you're having one drink or many, it doesn't matter. Obviously, drink responsible, obviously pace yourself, get a good night's sleep, don't, don't don't be like a jerk right when you're out, but in the morning, you feel so much more you know, refreshed and relaxed, ready to not only having a good day, but a, but a productive day, which I think is most important. So here's how it works. When you drink, there's a toxic byproduct of alcohol that builds up in your you know, unprepared gut. And it's this byproduct, not dehydration, that causes you to feel you know, just terrible and, and it just, just brutal the day after drinking. So Zbiotics came up with this enzyme, like the one your liver uses, to break down this byproduct and prepare you for the drinks that you're about to have. This is real science that works. There's no random plant extracts, no off-the-shelf ingredients. Uh, it's a hundred percent money back guarantee, so you literally can't lose. But I highly recommend you order Zbiotics and get fifteen percent off with the code Theo and Harris. And the next morning after you do drink, you're gonna feel a hell of a lot better. Just don't forget to have that Zbiotics before the night begins. And so everyone, head on over to Zbiotics.com/slash Theo and Harris to save fifteen percent off your first order. Fast forward into uh, the 1970s. Now the world is a different place. We're living in a post-Genta world. Now while Cartier may have invented this idea of, of, of juxtaposing elegance and, and, and industrial design, they're not the ones that popularized it. Right, uh, just the same way that Alexander Graham Bell didn't invent the telephone. So all my Italian folks out there, it's Columbus Day, they're like, yeah, that's right, fucking Antonio Meucci. <laughs> uh, anyway, so late 1970s, 1978, I believe, Cartier said, all right, we are living in a post-Genta world. Let's, let's, let's scrape the dirt off our knees and let's figure out how we compete, right? Because the world right now does not want elegance, right? They don't just, they don't just want elegance. They don't want grandpa's old man, you know, uh, watch, right? They want something that has a bracelet, number one, something that is industrial, something, something that's younger, right? It's something that fits the new form of what rich means, you know? So Cartier revisited their, uh, their classic Santos model and released the Santos de Cartier collection. Um, and it was the Santos Carré was the first. Now, uh, this particular watch is a lovely, unpolished uh, Cartier Santos Carré. Um, the reason why it's so important that a watch like this is unpolished is because, like the Royal Oak um, and the Nautilus, but even more so the Royal Oak, so much of its beauty is in its original grain polishing and 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 its its you know uh, meeting those harsh edges of edges of, of the of the of the uh, satin polish, right? So so it's uh, when it's polished, it loses the whole point. You know, it loses the whole point. So. Um, this watch is available in the Theo and Harris watch shop, but I also have one in two-tone. This one just happens to not be mine. Um, incredible watches. They've increased in value quite a bit in the last couple of years, but they're still, uh, relatively speaking to the watch world, um, they're very affordable, very approachable. Um, listen to the, the quality of that clasp. Great. Uh, that's total watch ASMR, you know? 
yeah. Um, anyway, lovely watch. You could see that Cartier clearly understood the assignment, right? They understood what living in a post-gentle world looked like. They went from this and this to this, right? Incredible. And keeping, again, this is the Santos collection, but keeping so true to the original Santos watches, Right of the early 1900s, um, which 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 uh, was a predecessor to any of these tanks. Right, that was the first Cartier. So uh, so it's, I think it's it, it it was perfect, and that's why they're they're still so desirable. And frankly, I would say that Cartier's first attempt at the Santos, which was the Santos Carré, has been their best attempt at the Santos to date. And the new Santos watches are fantastic. I'm sure that many of you guys watching out there own them, uh, and they really are worthy of being owned, certainly. Um, but I think that how dramatic the first iteration was, you know, the, the drama and the design, that was just, that was height Cartier Santos. Now they're a little bit more streamlined, they're a little bit softer, they're lovely, but they're smoother. This wasn't smooth, you know, this was, this was a, if Cartier made a fucking Royal Oak, what does it look like? And that was smart, you know, now they're still great, but they're not as great. So I don't just own this watch in two-tone. I also own it in yellow gold. And before I show you that watch, I want to talk for one second about our podcast, the Theo and Harris podcast, which you can find anywhere where podcasts are hosted, like Spotify and Apple Music, where basically Michael and I sit down for once or twice a week sometimes and talk for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 minutes about mostly watches. It's always a watch-driven conversation, naturally, but it, it always evolves into conversations about technology and about culture, and it's a fantastic, fantastic time recording it. Some of the, one of my favorite things I think I do for a living is, is record those podcasts. So head on over, definitely, and take a look. We recently spoke about the Apple Watch, and I think I got quite heated about it. So now let's get into the Mac Daddy. Oh, God, it's so heavy. Listen to this noise. My God. Listen to this clasp. Sorry, it's Michael here, everyone. Just saying hi. We're trying We're trying to see if the videos do better if we do solo Christian and solo me. So let me know what you think of that. Anyways, Christian, tell us what that band sounds like. Again, uh, a watch that I have always wanted. Um, a watch that I never thought I'd be able to own. One, because they're very expensive, but f*** that. Uh, uh, even, even aside from that. They're almost like impossible to find, and they're really almost impossible to find in great condition. And for me, like I said before, unpolished is big with, with these watches, or close to unpolished. And I found one. Um, I actually found one last uh, last winter. It was a snowstorm. It happened to be for sale pretty close to where I lived. Uh, when I say pretty close, I mean like four blocks away, which is hysterical. Some A dealer friend that lived four blocks away had one in ladies, one in men's. I bought both. I tried to like see if my girlfriend wanted one. Uh, not that I was going to sell it to her, but like, you know, like you want to you have like boyfriend, girlfriend? Nah, she didn't care. So uh, whatever, you know, <laughs> such is the plight of man, you know, and uh, anyway, I kept this one, you know, and I saved like 15 grand by not giving her hers, you know, so uh, anyway, the watches are very, very similar. This is the Gordon Gecko watch from Wall Street. Um, it's just unapologetic, you know, it's just an unapologetic late 70s, but 80s watch, you know, um, I, I genuinely think that if I was rich in the in 1981, I probably would have bought this watch. I would have been a new owner of this watch. You know, I don't think I would have got a Daytona. I know I wouldn't have gotten a Daytona. I might have, I might have purchased a Day-Day, but I, I certainly would have had this, you know? So that's cool. All these years later to know that uh, you kind of really understand your style no matter when, you know? So anyway, uh, I wear this watch all the time. I wear it both sporty and I wear it dressy. I literally wear it constantly. It's probably my most worn watch, period. Um, so good and f***ing heavy, man. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of, a couple more pieces I wanted to talk about, and then that's it for today's conversation. But other thing is Cartier's tank uh, Vermeil. This is modeled after the tank Louis. Um, you know they've they've uh, started these in the 1970s um, as a more affordable tank. Uh, made Cartier approachable. They're still great watches. I adore them. I've owned them in my personal collection. Um, not just when I couldn't afford the the Tank Louise and the solid gold models, but even after, because I think that they're just great value and they're beautiful. Um, I think it's it's a terrific starter Cartier, but it's a terrific Cartier at any point. You know, uh, this watch is available in the Theo and Harris watch shop. And the last thing I wanted to you know kind of talk about was Cartier. You know, it's hard to say you invented a you know, invented a style that we now see all around us. But I really do feel like Cartier invented this style, right? They didn't invent white dials and Roman numerals, no. But they invented the white dial and the Roman numeral and the blue sword hands with the precious metal square case. And if they didn't invent it, then they sure as hell 
are the only reason why it's popular ever and today included. So, um, and I don't think that, I think that a lot of brands would stipulate that, right? I think that for this example, Universal Genève in this oversized, beautiful example um, of, a, of a tank style watch, again, tank style, not a tank, because that's the tank. Um, uh, Universal Genève, I bet would stipulate that. They'd say, yeah, you know, they were the same way that Cartier reacted to Gerald Genta's Royal Oak, we reacted to Cartier Tank Louis. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. And, and in fact, I think it presents great opportunities because oftentimes you can own fantastic tank style watches from huge, uh, 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 you know, or rather hugely you know, popular and uh, brands held in high esteem of watch collectors, Universal Genève uh, at the top, really, especially under $10,000. Um, and this watch, which again is available in the Hair Shop, I think embodies that style really, really well. I think it's just... Um, I think it's perfect. It's like a flawless style, oversized case, maybe even better than Cartier in some instances because of the size. Right? Because this is oversized, it probably fits better on the wrist of a lot of folks. Uh, and because it's, you know, $3,000, it's a hell, of, a hell of a lot easier on the wallet as well. Um, anyway, when I saw this watch, I knew I had to buy it and I knew I wanted to offer it. Another example is this beautiful Bauer Mercier. It's like an elongated tank normal with those wider rails. Incredible presence on the wrist and terrific value and manually wound and solid yellow gold and everything. But of course, it is, you know, in the wake of Cartier. This is not original. It's beautiful. It's worth owning. It's a, a tremendous value prop. Throw back the Owen Harris word. But, but it is in the wake of Cartier. There's nothing original about this watch. But not everything has to be original. Right? Some things are just good. And that's it. I just want to talk about Cartier today. So this was cool. It's good to be back. Maybe we'll do more of these. Drop a comment down below if you think we should. And uh, I guess go take a look at the Theo and Harris watch shop. Remember, they're vintage. So they're one of a kind. And once they're gone, they're gone for good. So don't walk. Run. <laughs>